much. Good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I think my remit today is to talk briefly about where we are with evidence-based medicine in equine practice. Um, and I'm, this will be very much a personal um, view of this subject. And I'm really wearing three hats here. First and foremost, I'm an equine vet. I work at Bell Equine. I've been worked there for 20 years. Um, but I'm also on the um, board of the British Equine Veterinary Association. And I'm also editor of Equine vet Veterinary Education. And for those who don't know what Equine vet Veterinary Education is, it is the um, official postgraduate educational journal of the British Equine Veterinary Association and the American Association of Equine Practitioners. So we have a circulation list of over 12,000 equine vets around the world. Um, so it's quite a, a useful resource um, when we come to consider where we might uh, go with evidence-based medicine in equine practice. So when I was asked to do this talk, I thought <clears throat> there's already been talk about randomized controlled trials and how important they are maybe in, uh, in therapeutic uh, questions and uh, clinical questions that we are faced with on a daily basis. So I just put a simple PubMed search for horse and randomized control trial and found to my surprise 834 citations because I wasn't really expecting that many, believing that there were very few of these trials conducted in that kind of practice. But when you look through those 834 uh, citations, you find an awful lot of them really aren't applicable um, in, to equine practice in general, and a lot of them are very narrow uh, and um, specialized. But in terms of treatment, um, availability of treatments for different diseases, uh, we can narrow down the, the, the 834 to a number, a much smaller number of controlled trials. And these are just two that at the top of the list I've just picked at random, really. So the top one there is the efficacy of an avirulent live vaccine against Lawsonia intracellularis in the prevention of proliferative enteropathy in experimentally infected weanling foals. Now, <clears throat> Lawsonia uh, intracellularis causes this disease called proliferative enteropathy, which has become a, an emerging disease really in the last 10 years and in some areas of the world is a very important cause of morbidity and, and even death in, in young uh, foals and weanlings especially. So it's really important that we have information about treatment and prevention of these sorts of diseases. But then if you look in more detail <coughs> sorry, at this uh, study and many other studies in this um, that, that were picked up by PubMed, you find they're the experimental studies. So in this particular paper that came out of California, they had 12 foals divided into three groups. So there were three groups of four foals each, um, two of which were given the vaccine and one wasn't. Um, so, the actual level of evidence coming out of this type of study is relatively low when you compare it to what's hap happening in the field, because what's happening in an experimental challenge with the bacteria is very different to what happens in the natural world. But there are other now more and more randomized controlled trials becoming available. Uh, and these, are, again, are two that are at the top of the list. Both of these were published in the Equine Veterinary Journal. Um, looking at treatments using naturally occurring disease, which for us is much more important because obviously this applies, we can apply this information directly to the animals that we're treating and we're faced on a daily basis. So the top one, for example, is a randomized trial looking at the efficacy of this extract of green-lipped muscle in horses with chronic fetlock lameness, and they had 26 horses with naturally occurring fetlock lameness, confirmed fetlock fetlock lameness, and then looked at the, the effects of treatment uh, using a partial crossover trial. So there are studies out there. They are difficult to produce. They're expensive to produce, and that's almost certainly why they are very limited uh, in, our, in our field. So turning to the, the journal, as I say, equine veterinary education uh, is uh, circulated to a large number of equine vets around the world. Uh, and we certainly have tried to promote the ideas um, of evidence-based medicine and clinical audit over the past five to ten years. And there was discussion earlier about the importance or not of clinical audit and evidence-based medicine and where that fits in. Um, so this is just an example. This is an editorial that we published uh, back in 2006, trying to promote the ideas 
um, of the importance of using clinical audit in order to improve our practice standards, but also the use of evidence-based medicine, because of course you, the biggest problem that we face is that in order to undertake things like clinical audit, we do need good evidence, and that evidence is somewhat lacking. So at the same time, we started publishing um, what we called evidence-based clinical questions, uh, and we've published 13 of these since 2006. And these are really using the principles of evidence-based medicine, asking a relevant clinical question, and then looking at the literature to, to assess it and try and answer it. So uh, these are some examples <clears throat> that we published uh, over the last few years. So, the first one is, does early antibiotic use in horses with strangles cause metastatic streptococcus equi bacterial infections? And the reason we ask this question is it's widely believed um, by many practitioners that horses with strangles, which as you may or may not be aware is quite a common bacterial infection causing abscessation in the uh, lymph nodes around the head, if you, the, the perception was that if you treat these horses early on with antibiotics, it actually increased the risk of these horses developing a, a metastatic spread of that bacteria to other parts of the body, the so-called bastard strangles. Um, so the question we had in, was, is this really true or not? Uh, and so we looked at the literature, assessed it, and came up with the conclusion that there was no evidence whatsoever that this was true. And then uh, a series of other questions that we asked, uh, such as, does dantrolene sodium prevent recurrent exertional rhabdomyolysis in horses? Uh, rhabdomyolysis is a, co a common, painful, and important disease that we see on a daily basis. Uh, and evidence about the effective treatments for these is, of course, uh, of, of utmost importance to us. Are toad grabs a risk factor for catastrophic musculoskeletal injury in racehorses? very important welfare implications and questions here. Um, so the, the idea behind this was to try and stimulate an evidence-based medicine approach towards answering some clinically relevant questions. Then turning to our, our sister publication, which is the Equine Veterinary Journal, which publishes research but primarily research papers. Uh, again, over the last five to ten years, there has been a move towards uh, trying to promote the concept of evidence-based medicine. Um, so at the top there's an editorial that Celia Ma, who's now, now current editor of Equine Veterinary Journal, published um, back in 2003, talking about the, the principles of evidence-based medicine. And then later in that year, Peter Rostol, who was then editor, uh, his colleagues Leo Jeffcott and Mark Holmes, published another e editorial talking about clinical evidence, trying to promote the uh, submission of articles uh, to the journal that would fulfill certain criteria uh, and they called these clinical evidence articles and they were published over several years uh, so primarily that they were promoting the fast track um, handling of these articles of research articles that they felt and the editorial board felt would directly influence practice by providing strong evidence regarding cause diagnosis treatment or prognosis and it listed here are just some examples of, of clinical evidence articles that were published during that period. Then in terms of what's been done by BEVA, or British Equine Veterinary Association, um, again around the same time in the early uh, 2002, 2003, um, there was a move within BEVA to try and promote um, evidence-based medicine approach. Uh, and there was a realization that there was a lack of data available to us on many important common diseases that we treat on a daily basis in equine practice. So we, the, since 2003, there have been three projects run by Beaver to try and accumulate data from uh, first opinion veterinary practices. So the first one was uh, looking at the analgesic use in colic, and that ran from 2003 to 2004, and we accumulated just over a thousand cases of equine colic colic of course is a very important and common uh, emergency situation in equine practice. Uh, and with the variety of different treatments available, the, uh, the objective of this study was really to look at what people in, uh, what vets in first opinion practice were using uh, and to try and identify whether there was any, uh, any advantage in using particular analgesics or analgesic combinations uh, for horses presenting with colic. Um, the results of this study did 
give us a lot of information about the nature of colics um, being identified in first opinion practice. Uh, the results have been presented at several meetings, both nationally and internationally. Uh, and they haven't yet been published because it did turn up a, a somewhat surprising um, finding, and that was the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which are very, very commonly used as the first-line treatment for equine comic, colic, did appear to be associated with a poor survival rate. Now, this was somewhat difficult to explain, um, but, and when hopefully this study does need to be validated by other studies, and it's good to see that Nottingham, for example, have now got a, a study of equine colic going, which is um, posters up at the back of the room, um, because this sort of common disease that we, we see on a daily basis, we have a, a serious lack of understanding of the, the nature of the disease and the, and the most appropriate forms of treatment. The second study that Beaver did was on laminitis. This ran from 2005 to 2007, and they uh, managed to obtain information from 107 horses with primary laminitis. Laminitis, again, is a very common and important and painful disease of horses that we see very, very commonly in first opinion practice. Uh, and this again generated some useful information which has been published in a couple of publications, one of them is highlighted there. And then the final study which was run between 2010 and 2011 looked at uh, in, in parasite related diseases. And the objective again was to obtain information about the prevalence the, of these type of diseases in the first opinion equine practice, look at the, the the reasons for them happening, look at their treatments and the outcomes. This wasn't terribly uh, well, well the, the response rate from practitioners was fairly poor. Uh, we only got 20 cases of this disease called sarthostomiosis, which is one of the most important and common conditions caused by small redworm infestation in horses. So, to sum up, there is a move towards trying to promote the ideas of evidence-based medicine in equine practice. Uh, randomized controlled trials are, are lacking, and one of the biggest problems, of course, with that is the expense associated with them, as already been mentioned today. Um, so some sort of coordination uh, of randomized trials, ideally in some sort of centralized and impartial fashion, uh, would be terribly helpful to try and improve or increase the number of, uh, of or increase the amount of evidence available from these type of studies. Education of, of veterinary surgeons in practice to uh, try and promote uh, and realization of the relevance of, of evidence-based medicine to their daily practice and that may be something that we should be promoting more through the journals. We do, I believe, need to engage practitioners more in data collection, and again, this has already been touched on this morning. So patient-centered research, getting research data from the field, from first opinion cases, will likely give us much more useful information that we can use as evidence for developing um, other studies, for develop, improving our standard of care, uh, for undertaking clinical audit, and so on. For the practitioner, though, of course, assistance with the study design and data analysis is, is vitally important. Um, and the, so the, um, the availability of expertise in epidemiology and statistics uh, and collaboration between practices and universities uh, should allow this to be, uh, to be possible. And then the dissemination of the results uh, and the use of that, those results and the, the uh, availability of better evidence to practitioners uh, should again be something that should be feasible through, through the journals and the associations. Thank you.